All right, we are live as usual. And with my buddy, Dr. Tom Moorcroft. And uh, sorry, it seems like I'm yelling in the microphone. I don't know, I'm yelling, I'm the only one here. <laughs> but, uh, t tonight, we are going to talk about getting serious about Lyme disease. And I laughed, I did a little promo yesterday and I think it's funny, it's like, you know, the, the, the title, getting serious about Lyme disease, like Lyme patients aren't serious enough about their health, but- Oh, I know, right? It's uh, it's not really about that. And I think uh, Dr. Tom posted uh, the article that we're kind of basing this discussion on. So if you guys didn't have a get a chance to take a look at it, I forget it, it was published. Is it in the Times? It was, let's see, Scientific American. Scientific American. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's basically, you know, talking about how, you know, not that people, patients aren't getting serious about Lyme, but we as a country, we as a government, we as researchers, scientists, doctors have not really gotten serious about Lyme disease. And you consider like what happened back in the early 80s with HIV, the same thing kind of happened where, you know, HIV came on the scene, the government ignored it, public health ignored it, figuring it was eventually going to go away. And of course it didn't, it killed a lot of people. And at some point the government said, oh my gosh, this is really a big problem. We should probably do something about it. Then they started investing a lot of money into research. And ultimately, you know, we came out with all these medications and other things that, you know, fortunately people now with HIV live a lot longer and don't die with the rates they right. did, you know, 40 years ago. So the concept is kind of the same thing that, you know, we as, civilization really need to get serious about this this rapidly growing epidemic you know i think the latest reports is about in 400,000 new cases each year in the united states it's about 85,000 cases in europe about 2,000 cases in canada and you know that keeps growing exponentially so you know how are we as people who've been dealing with lyme disease going to deal with it and then collectively you know, how are we going to help influence, you know, government officials, public health officials to start making a dent in this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. And I, I just got to give a shout out to everybody here, um, but especially Lori, because she's like, hey, guys, entertain us. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do our best and good to see everybody else here. We appreciate it, you know. But, you know, it's interesting, Darren, that you start off that way because, you know, I mean, you just when you read that article, it's just like, you know, West Nile virus, which affects about 2000 people in the United States, gets about forty two million dollars per year, um, you know, and, you know, you get like for to, to address it. Right. And I mean, we need more money for Lyme. And it's like Zika, you know, it became like a big deal in 2016. And all of a sudden we have like one point one billion dollars going towards it because you know, there, there are like a few cases of birth defects and it's not to suggest that these things aren't important and we shouldn't be preventing these birth defects and we shouldn't be trying to prevent mosquito borne illnesses. But, you know, I, I just saw the other day, there is, uh, you know, that I guess too, the, the part of it is Lyme disease is getting like at least a 10th of what Zika got yet. There's 42,000 cases. And I just saw, like, I was just scrolling through yesterday and I found that this is because I'm going to do a lecture in Maine next Friday or next Saturday, I should say, and I'm prepping for it. And I'm looking through all the data because I like to know what's going up there. And the first thing that comes up when you talk about it is this big thing on the Maine CDC and in all the papers about one guy getting, you know, a horse equine encephalitis. And yeah. that's absolutely horrible that one person got that. But that's like, now we're going to put all this money in the horse born and, you know, equine encephalitis, which there should be some, but we have to, when we have limited funds and limited people doing the resources, maybe go, hey, 42,000 new cases of Lyme disease um, at a baseline. And then probably like the CDC rec suggested, they're tenfold below that. So if we're at 350, 400,000 new cases per year, I mean, that, that's where we should be putting a little bit more money than we already have which I guess yeah. is the jumping off part for the entertainment this evening. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it's interesting because I think, you know, we as a, a government saying we being them, but, you know, <laughs> we have this knee jerk reaction when, remember like when Ebola came on the scene, the whole world flipped out. Uh, and again, you know, I was a microbiologist before I was a doctor. I remember when the first Ebola scene came on back in the early nineties, 
Uh, I actually met a reporter who was there on the scene. Oh, wow. You know, understanding Ebola is actually a very hard virus to get. You know, these are people that were caring for very sick people that were bleeding all over, and there was just no, you know, cleanliness. I mean, but as a as a public health issue, it's actually a very difficult infection to acquire. And yet, we wanted, you know, we had a vaccine ready to go within a month of Ebola coming on the scene. Right. So, you know, <laughs> I, I suppose it's a little bit about motivation. And, you know, here you had something that didn't affect anyone in the U.S. You know, there was one case, and that was someone who had traveled to that part of the world that brought it back to, to Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, and outside of that, it's like it's, it doesn't affect people here. And yet we've got this, this thing that affects, you know, now literally millions of people. Again, if you're talking about 400,000 new cases a year, I mean, you can do the math and figure out we now right. have this 40-year history of Lyme, how many people are dealing with Lyme disease. I mean, it's, it's a lot. So, you know, where is the the impetus to really start driving more funds, more more research, more resources, you know, to throw at it. Uh, and the one thing I read recently, I don't think it was attached to the Scientific American article. It was another article I posted earlier last week that there are some researchers that are now looking at targeting the tick. Right. Uh, where they really looking at disrupting the saliva of the tick to make it inhospitable so that it won't at least as easily be able to transmit Lyme. And you know, the, the reactions I got back from people where I, I posted that, they said, oh, great, now we're going to spray the entire world with some toxic chemical to kill the ticks. I'm like, that is not a great solution either. No. But I at least like that someone's thinking outside of the box as a way to help mitigate the damage right. if there's a way that we could selectively affect the ticks without harming humans and plants in the meantime and animals. Great. I think, you know, that's going to take a lot of work and I'm not sure how that's uh, that would happen. But if there is a way to try and do that, that's at least a different way of trying to address this this enormous problem. Yeah, well, you know, and I think the thing that I'm concerned about when I read that, like like you, I was stoked that somebody was checking it out. But the question really becomes, you know, what, how are we getting how are we affecting the tick salivary gland? And we're doing it by feeding it in, you know, basically you know, treated cow blood. So which that would be analogous to treating the tick with our blood, which means I'm sure they're one potential distribution method of this, this potential new um, Lyme disease prevention treatment would be giving us pills kind of pre pre, you know, tick bite, which kind of means, I don't know. I mean, does that become a vaccine? Does that become a pill that we're also anybody who lives in North America needs to take between like, say, January and January? I mean, and so it does, it does, right? I mean, ticks are out every month. Yeah. You know, and certainly do you do it in the high risk months? Do you do it all year? And so it's just something that's to think about, but I'm, I'm psyched that they're looking at it, you know, and then was it was at two or three days ago, um, MSN had a really good article with Dr. Christine Green and Paul Outwater and some other folks. And they're like, is chronic Lyme disease real? And, you know, I, I think, yeah, right. I'm like, <laughs> So we started to have the conversation and, and it was like, it was like kind of like really balanced. And then it got really, really sort of to the right. And then they kind of brought it back a little bit, but it was a, a, it was a fairly balanced discussion. But the thing is, I think the problem that I see is that people are like, it's all or nothing. Yeah. You know, you know right. I mean, we're, on, we're on both sides. It's like, yeah, everybody can get chronic Lyme, whether you call it chronic Lyme or persistent Lyme or, Everybody else over here is, you know, never ever can have it. And one of the things that's really concerning about the way that the sort of the right portrays itself in that article, as well as if you look at the new IDSA draft line guidelines, is they're saying that people with post Lyme, uh, post treatment Lyme disease syndrome can have post treatment Lyme disease syndrome without ever having a confirmed um, case of Lyme disease, which makes no sense to me. How can you have post-treatment anything if you haven't ever had that thing? <laughs> you know, but it's like, they're like, it is, these are people who have never been confirmed to have this infection. And I'm like, this is asinine. The people I see have had rashes that have been missed, or they had a bite that nobody followed up, or they have CDC positive Lyme disease in the absence of a rash. And they're like, oh, it's not Lyme. Or the great, my favorite one is I get bit by a tick. I have an erythema migrans rash. You go into the doctor, they diagnose you with Lyme disease. You give them doxycycline as you probably should. And then you do an ELISA test and it's negative. So you stop two days right. later. And yeah. I'm like, and what is, what does doxycycline do? 
<laughs> right. It suppresses the rash, right? Yeah, it stops the rash and it can stop antibody production as the um, prophylactic study, you know, that sucked, but at least it told us that. Yeah, so I mean, I just it, we, we have to be careful about the discussion. And I also feel like it's really important to not just have the discussion and say, everybody's got chronic Lyme. I mean, and I think one of the things that I love about our conversations and knowing what you do, reading your book, have, and talking with people like yourself and myself is we're looking for what's wrong, right? And we presuppose in the Lyme guidelines and in a lot of these articles that there's an underlying treatable thing. Like they said there, you know, a lot of the problems are with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is there is another plausible treatable underlying cause. I'm like, great, tell me what it is, let's treat it, right? Because if I could tell somebody that they didn't have Lyme disease, and fix them with something simple that's not chronic Lyme disease, hallelujah, that's what we want. Yeah, yeah, well, I think this might be a good time to, well, first of all, I guess, uh, Dr. Cohen, hey, thanks for joining us. I saw that she asked about whatever happened to that Lyme vaccine in a world where vaccines come out in a month, weird. Yeah, you know, as far as I know, they're still in development. You know, the last Lyme vaccine was kind of a disaster. You know, it targeted that, uh, I think it was the OSPA antigen, and they found it was actually triggering a lot of arthritis. So uh, a lot of people started getting the vaccine. They developed more arthritis and they got pulled off the market. Uh, plus my understanding is it wasn't doing very well anyway. So that got pulled, I think it was only in the market for three or four years. And I know there's plenty of companies that are out working on a new vaccine, uh, but yeah, I haven't heard of anything that's close to coming to market yet. I think it's gonna be complicated just that you've got so many different strains of Borrelia you know, to find a, a protein or a target that's common to all strains would really have to be important. And so I'm sure that's probably part of why they've been very slow to come to market with anything because you finding that I think is, is difficult, maybe impossible. I'm not sure. I, I don't work in molecular biology, but I'm sure that's going to be one of the big hurdles. <laughs> Tyler, yeah, the last thing we need is another vaccine, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it comes down to this thing of, you know, why do we have people who get exposed to Borrelia, don't get Lyme disease, other people do and get it and end up with these chronic symptoms. You know, as Tom and I have talked over the last however many sessions, I think we, this theme comes up over and over, you know, it's about the terrain. It's about the terrain of the individual. And if you're not addressing all these other underlying yeah. fundamental things with, you know, gut health and sleep and immune health and all that, it's going to be really, uh, you know, it's going to be problematic to get over that hump. Yeah, no, it's great. Hey, Scott, good to see you there. And Grace brings up a good point about the OSPE, you know. You know, it's interesting, too. I was just thinking about throwing in a comment about OSPE. And for those of you who don't know, that's a, when we look at the Lyme disease Western blot, OSPE reacts at the 31 kilodalton band. So in the Dearborn criteria from, was it 96 or something, where they decided what bands can be in the Western blot right. and what can't. They took out the 31 and the 34, so outer mm -hmm. surface protein A and B, in or, just because like if you had been vet, one of the 3,000 people vaccinated or 10,000, whatever that number was, now nobody on the planet can ever use that one again, which made no sense to me because I have a really cool solution for that is when people come in my office, I actually talk to them and I say, hey, have you ever been vaccinated <laughs> For you know, with the vaccine before, and they're like, no. I'm like, okay, good. Well, then that OSP A is probably not from vaccine, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. They taught me that. I think the first day of medical school. <laughs> well, you know, it's really interesting about the OSP A antigen itself is that that is expressed in the tick saliva until it bites you, and then after it bites you, it is suppressed. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that they use that as a target anyway, because you actually need the, the 23, the OSPC uh, for infection. That is necessary for infection, but OSPA is not. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like it was a strange target anyway. You know, that's in the past, I'm sure at this point. You know, like right. I, I have no faith that a vaccine is going to be helpful. Uh, that's my my thought and been my experience with other vaccines. So I... I would be very cautiously, cautiously optimistic that any vaccine that comes to market would really help the majority of people anyway. But right. I know well, it's something that's in the works and you know, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I've heard rumors that they're working on an OSPE, OSPC and stuff. But again, like the, the I feel like the common sense is missing here, you know? And it's a, a lot about these things. It's like, do you really think that like, I just created chronic Lyme disease as a diagnosis or this group of people did so they could just, 
launch out diagnosis after diagnosis of chronic Lyme without looking for anything else. You know, I mean, our goal is to help people get better. And I mean, you know, looking at terrain, like you said, it, I mean, it, it really goes back to, and I find that this is the most complicated part of medicine for me uh, these days is it's really the, the, the personal responsibility aspect, you know, certainly when you're ill, but when you're not ill, like prevention, preventive medicine is not about like making sure your cholesterol is really low so that you go on an antidepressant like later on in life, but it's really about figuring out how you can take responsibility for for optimizing your health so that if you do right. get bit by this tick you can feel you know you're 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 in you want to make your body you know as least hospitable for this organism as possible and and we know how to do those things yeah well you know i i um i think you know it's a good reminder too of people you know who've been thrown in that quagmire of you know do i have lyme do I not have lyme just as a reminder you know that lyme diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis you know the testing out there was never ever designed to be diagnostic it was used as a surveillance tool for people that had known lyme disease these were people that had the rash had all the classic symptoms and they wanted a way to monitor it so you know to this day if you go to the cdc's website on their front page on lyme disease testing mm -hmm. it tells you it's based on signs and symptoms and basically if you live in an area where there's a lot of ticks which nowadays is a lot of places so you know the, the lab tests out there are still only a confirmatory test to validate your your suspicion a negative test certainly doesn't exclude the possibility of having lyme or any of the other tick-borne illnesses so you know i i still get irritated when you know i and we, we see this in our practices you know you you probably had your own experience with it where you know you went to your doctor and it's like oh you didn't get a rash therefore you don't have lyme uh, or you don't have certain symptoms, you don't have Lyme. You know, look, Lyme presents us a lot of different ways. And I, I say everyone's Lyme is their Lyme, and the way it affects them is very individualized. So, you know, the fact that there's upwards of 100 or more symptoms associated with Lyme disease, to say that you fit a specific mold of Lyme, I think is really short-sighted. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'm just pulling it up because I, I in this research for that, um, lecture I'm doing up in Maine, um, it's really kind of cool because I'm looking back at 2017 when they had a pretty big tick year, a pretty big Lyme year. Um, EM rash was present in 48 of confirmed cases, 48%. Arthritis in 29%, neurologic 11%, and cardiac was only 0.5% of people, which is a good thing. But last year, bullseye rashes, the EM was only seen in 46% of confirmed cases. And arthritis was like 34%. So we go back and we're looking at these things where this is the classic presentation. And the CDC says, you know, like 70 some percent of people are going to have this rash, you know, yeah. and forever I've looked at the literature and it always comes up 40 to 60% of people have the rash. And that's what we're seeing in, in clinical practice from confirmed cases that meet everybody's criteria. Right. And then you look at people who require um, a greater level of expertise to ferret out what's going on and digging deeper. And, and you know, I, I was just um, looking over some of the notes I took from Ann Kors, a lecture from Ann Corson a bunch of years ago. Her practice, um, she's found something like 12 to 14% of people remember having an erythema migrans type rash. Yeah, I, I, I've never kept official statistics in my practice, but I bet you if I did, it would probably be close to that. I, it's definitely less than 20% of people that I see ever recall having have a rash. So, yeah, just not a, a very reliable marker. Uh, I see Lori commented, or, or yeah, Lyme isn't in this state. Yeah, Lyme has never been reported in all 50 states. So if you live in a state where Lyme may not be as endemic and your doctor's telling you you don't have Lyme in that state, uh, you can invite them to learn how to read because that's not true. <laughs> Uh, Diane. Did, I, did I tell you the, the case? I had a I had a, a friend of mine um, who's a DO in Oklahoma get, gave me a call and he was telling me he had a patient who uh, told me he got bit by a tick and then he had a rash. So he came in. He said, look, I'm in Oklahoma. You know, I don't know, probably not Lyme, but it looks like a Lyme rash. So let's just take a picture or whatever. And like, let's get the blood test. So the guy comes back two tier positive for Lyme disease. Right. And so they were, he puts him on treatment, takes care of him, but then he, um, you know, he, he reports it to the state and the state's like, there's no way there's Lyme disease here. And he's like, well, yeah, I have the guy right here. Oh, he must've traveled. He's like, he, and he checked with the patient, no travel, right? And so the guy goes, well, 
you know, I, he's got the rash and he didn't travel and he's got Western blot, I mean, two tier positive. So they're just like, oh, no, can't be true. So he goes, the patient goes, well, I got the tick. And it gave him the tick, tested the tick, and it had Borrelia burgdorferi in it. And they're like, it must have come off of a songbird. I'm like, that's probably true, but it's still in Oklahoma. <laughs> you got to report it as being in Oklahoma. I mean, it's like, I mean, how can you, this is just like, where, where do people, like the science, like we have to be true to the science, you know? And it's like, if, 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 I, if you look at like pans and pandas over the years, the more and more and more we're true to science, and I'm certainly seeing this in line, the more and more doctors in the trenches who are seeing people on the front line are actually starting to change and treat people. You know, I mean, we have local infectious disease docs at the children's hospital now are doing things like, you know, like actually treating kids for pandas, even when their blood tests are negative because they're symptomatic. You know, oh, wow, not in our hospitals. <laughs> I, right around the corner. And I hope a little bit of it was the fact that I'm true to the science and I keep arming my parents and, and the practitioners around the state that I talk to um, and uh, with information that's science based. But also we had the um, we had an advisory council in the state and it was started by a group of people who just started talking to the legislators and they made them make, they passed this thing. And basically none of us got paid. There was like no funding to do anything, but it brought people from Yale, Connecticut Children's, the state, all, all pe nurses from schools and everybody together. And now a couple of years later, after we all sat in a room once, or, uh, once a month and stuff like that, and then every other month until everybody just kind of said, well, we have no funding to go any further you start to see that trickle out, trickle effect. And it's like, so I really would like to share with people that if you're, if you're angry about this or you're motivated about this, and if you're angry, change it to motivation, you know, because that's for your own health and for, for this cause, is to go out there and get creative. I mean, they literally helped the legislators write a law that made certain people have to be on the committee. But then the other thing they did was they also put in people from like all teams. So it wasn't just written like, oh, it's just like Tom and Darren and Tyler sitting at it around, you know, and Scott sitting around a table, you know, they, they brought in everybody, but they made sure like that one, I think the way they put me on there was like, there, there has to be a DO who treats Lyme and treats pandas and is in, lives in Connecticut and one other thing. And like the only person in the entire state who could fit that seat was me. So the, the, the Department of Health had to put me on it. You know, and the, the thing was, so they got creative about how to solve the problem and they took their anger and seeing their children suffering and, and, and really put it into that positive way to make that mission work. But I guess the other point is when you do start to, when you hold doctors accountable to science, they eventually start to like that, right? Because we're, we're trained in science. And when you start to share papers with people, it makes a big difference. So rather than getting upset and saying, oh, you don't believe me or whatever, you know, use some of the resources that are really science-based, you know, and I just think that's really important. Yeah, gosh, you know, maybe we should do a webinar one night just to teach folks if you're not familiar with using PubMed, because this is the database base that all doctors, scientists use. This is where all peer-reviewed research gets published. It's actually a very simple tool to learn how to use, and uh, we can teach you how to do, you know, different searches to find very specific articles. And, uh, you know, I think all of us say, uh, you know, once you get infected with Lyme, you become a bit of a science nerd, whether you like it or not, just because you're trying to figure out your own health. But you're going to get a lot of really great information, and you, you know it, and we know it. You're doing more work for Lyme than your doctor is, particularly if they're not a Lyme literate doctor, so to speak. So, you know, again, it's very uh, reasonable and fair to come in and without being confrontational saying, hey, look, I came across these articles. I think you might find them interesting. I, I dropped them off for you. Please you know, take a look at it. I'd love for you to read it and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And, you know, put it back on them. You know, they're the doctor, they're the scientists. They know how to read these articles. So, you know, push them a little bit to expand their knowledge base and learning. And, you know, you may not necessarily get a convert out of all of them, but, uh, it may be worth a try and you, you might find that you have an ally that you didn't have before. And a lot of times what I find too, and I've had some recent experience with this that has been fairly positive is when you present evidence. So like, let's say you're dealing with the school or the state or whatever. One of the things that's really important to do is to be true to the science and, and, and be true to where the gap is. 
Um, because a lot of times if there's a group, say that, um, uh, a state um, department of children's services contacts me and I, I, I tell them what I, my, what I believe is true. They're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not what the hospital said, or that's not what these four other doctors said. I said, well, I, I professionally respect their opinion. Um, but based on my direct evaluation of this patient, I disagree with what they're saying in a professional way. And what I like to do is I'm going to send you this note that summarizes what I just said. But I'm also going to attach the, the references that support what I said. And every single time, I, and I mean, I've done this in, you know, one page letters with six references. It doesn't even have to be that crazy, but a lot, but I get back all the time. They're like, oh, you're the only doctor who actually has any literature to support what you do. Right. And so even, and, and these are typically in the cases where I'm the most irritated, where I'm the most pissed off. I'm like, how can nobody see this? But I still go back to, I'm speaking with people who are held to, um, should be held to a higher standard, right? This, we have this evidence-based medicine standard and we have medical evidence. And so I think they all forget what evidence-based medicine is, which is, you know, the best medical evidence, clinician experience and patient preference kind of all melded together. But if we can at least talk to them on the science end of things, I think that that's a really good thing. And I've seen it work. Um, it's very frustrating because it doesn't always work. But I also think we need to continue to do that. Um, looks like we have a bunch of questions, eh? That are yeah. awesome. So, uh, Diane, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, can you get Lyme and then have it go away without taking anything? Uh, I'll answer, Tom, and I'll let you chime in. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, it's possible there are some people that can get exposed. Uh, and then, you know, because they're taking care of their health in different ways, their gut's really optimal, and they're eating well, and they really take care of themselves. Uh, it is possible. I think in my practice, though, I get people when they've been dealing with this for a long time. So they're probably past that point where just doing nothing, because clearly that's what they've been doing prior to, and it has not helped them. So that's not the bulk of people I'm working with. So I think it is possible. I think there's a way to get your body healthy through doing just, you know, eating well and taking care of yourself. But I think most people I'm working with need more than that to really get over the hump. Yeah, I mean, I kind of have a, the, a same, similar experience. And certainly I've seen people who, you know, especially when I was training originally with Dr. Jones, a couple, you know, there's a few families who came in where everybody's really sick, their labs don't look good. And then, you know, there's like two parents and two kids and, you know, two or three kids and two of the kids are really sick. One is completely fine. One or both of the parents are sick. And then, you know, because everybody's so sick, the one kid who's completely fine, they go check their labs and, every band is positive, right? And it's like, but the kid's perfectly fine. And even when, even years after this test is drawn, the kid's like completely fine, you know? So it's not like, you know, it's four or five years out, the likelihood of that really staying dormant and then popping up with no repercussions, you know, with repercussions is really low. And, you know, you look at it and you're just like, hey, maybe that kid did okay. And there's certainly, there's over a hundred strains of, of Borrelia that cause Lyme disease in the country, right? And so when you look at that, you, there's got to be ones that are more virulent, you know, right. more potent than others. And so That's maybe true. somebody got one that wasn't that bad. And, you know, so you definitely should be taking care of yourself the best you can. Um, but you've all, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen this. I've had people come in. I had a, one of my, you know, in the first year or two of my practice, some guy comes in, he's like, doc, you got to fix me. He's like, and, and, you know, I, I really think that if you don't fix me in the next month or two, I'm going to end it. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, I thought about it. I'm just going to jump off the roof. I'm like, what are you talking about? What have you done? It's like, I've been sick for five years, you know, and I, I just, I'm, I'm fed up. And I'm like, who'd you go to? And he's like, oh, my primary. And I got doxy like twice. And I was like, well, that, let's calm down. We could, there's a place to start. But I gave him a very simple herbal protocol and he comes in a month later and he's like 95% better. Like, I mean, you know, it's like a once in a lifetime shot, but at the same time, then he would get bit by more ticks because he's outside all the time and herbs work for him, you know? And this guy was like, he, he comes in last year and he, he had um, got bitten by a tick. He looked really gray, did some labs. He has no white cells, no red cells, no platelets. They're all really low. 
Turns out he has babesiosis, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and Borrelia miyamotoi, all from the same tick bite. Pretty impressive. And within a week of being on antibiotics, he's fine. And three months of antibiotics followed by four more months of the herbs that we had started doing it. And he's like completely normal. But this is not the usual person I see, right? right? But but it is possible. And and the other thing that I was um, wanted to say was, you know, there there we see a select group of people in our practices. And a lot of the people who are watching probably are part of that group, you know? So there are other people out there who get Lyme, they get three weeks of prac of treatment and they do okay. With the one caveat that when you look at um, a couple of years, uh, it's probably almost a decade ago now, they did a survey along the East Coast of primary care providers, pediatricians, family practice, internal medicine. And they said, how long do you, and, 49% treated for longer than three weeks for Lyme. And most were more than six, most of those 49% or whatever were over six weeks. Yeah. So a lot of the people that aren't coming to us have a doctor who's treating them a bit longer. Yeah. So we're seeing the sickest of the sick too, but there's a lot of them. And, you know, we can't just put our head in the sand. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see, Don mentions, yeah, she didn't get a rash after the bite. That's pretty common. Lori says too many false negatives with the test. Absolutely. Especially when you order them at the wrong time, like yeah. right away. Uh, Dr. Cohen says, so a patient comes in, pull the tick out of him, no rash, no idea how long it was there and threw the tick away. What would you do? Tom, what would you do? Well, I, I guess it depends on a couple of things. One is where do they live? What kind of tick was it? And typically if someone came into Connecticut and said that I'd you know, have the conversation about prophylaxis and offer some form of prophylaxis. I mean, I'm, usually in my experience, we can get pretty darn close to knowing whether it was a dog tick, a, a lone star tick or a deer tick, which are the common ticks in my area. And the deer tick is by far the, the biggest concern for me. So if they're like, hey, this is a lone star tick, I know what's in there, I know what I might want to prophylax against. If it's a dog tick, I know what's in there. I also know the infection rates of those ticks in our area. So those two ticks I'm less concerned about, but I usually don't watch and wait. It's just, it's too risky. Um, and certainly I've been very successful in doing prophylaxis with antibiotics as well as an herbal protocols, depending upon what makes the best sense. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. It's like, you know, if someone comes in, they have a, a, a tick bite, they throw away the tick or their, you know, their husband came home, they were out, you know, hunting or whatever. They said, oh yeah, I got a tick bite. I picked the tick off. I threw it away. Uh, my feeling is uh, early treatment leads to a better prognosis. If you really don't know, I try and educate my patients to be familiar. Yeah. The difference between what a deer tick looks like, a, a wood tick, a dog tick, all that. Uh, they're not super difficult to discern and having that knowledge can help you really understand whether you need to be more proactive with treatment. But if you really just don't know at all, my feeling is, you know, there's a way to be uh, proactive, treat it prophylactically, see how you feel over the course of the next month. Uh, I'd rather be safe than sorry. Yeah. And, you know, I, I used to tell people like, you know, we want to start at least if you're going to do antibiotic prophylaxis, but any kind of prophylaxis, you want to get it absolutely sooner, the better, but within five days. And I was talking to Betty Maloney the other day, and it's actually looking like you want to really get it started within two. I mean, we really don't want to wait and never do you want to say, oh, well, I can, you know, it's two days. Let's just wait till five to start it. But certainly we used to think that it would be long, you know, we could wait a little longer. But the other thing too is like, the the treat even if we just like leave herbs out for a minute which are infinitely safer i think than antibiotics in most situations the the thing that's that's important i think is you know what are the risks versus the benefits including patient preference and so if i know it's a deer tick bite and i you know i i'm sorry i don't agree with this 36 to 48 hour attachment rule all right. I mean, first of all, there are three cases at least that are published on PubMed in the medical literature. Yeah, the research doesn't support that at all. Either. Right. The research doesn't support it. Um, I know people who have submitted articles, including myself, with cases confirming less than 24 hours of tick attachment that have been rejected because the readers didn't need to know about that. And I'm like, well, that's censorship. Good science, but our readers don't know about need to know about that New England Journal of Medicine. I don't get it. Right. Why? The, the purpose of the medical literature is for us to have a professional conversation. 
So if we put the information out there and somebody's like, hey, you know what? I don't like the way that testing was done. I don't agree with your scientific method. That's a great place to have the discussion is, you know, right in, right, right back in and start that professional dialogue. But to, yeah. to, for, for an editor to be censoring, I mean, if it's horse shit, you know, and you didn't follow the rules, that's one thing. But if you have good, decent science that maybe they don't agree with, but you followed the rules and you followed the scientific method, let's put it out there and have that discussion. You know, I think that's, that's another important piece because we, the, we do not know the, the minimum um, um, duration for tick attachment to be able to transmit Lyme has never been established. Right. Same with babesiosis. And, you know, I mean, if we're talking about the tick salivary glands and you've, there have been, you know, not a lot, it's rare, but we have found spirochetes in the tick salivary glands. It is, if that's, remains true in the tick that bites you, there's the possibility that when that tick bites you, injects its anticoagulant, injects its anesthetic so that you don't feel it, it could in, near instantaneously inject Lyme disease into you. Now, should we all run around and freak out, you know, that that instantaneous transmission happens? No, but we do know that physiologically, it's at least a possibility. And so we should be, we should be on the lookout for it, not censoring that possibility. Yeah, you know, I think we get so hung up on, you know, this time about the transmission of Lyme. And as you mentioned, we know from the research that other co-infections get transmitted much faster than Lyme. Oh you know, we know that rickettsia, Bartonella, anaplasma, much, much faster than Borrelia. So whether Lyme is even the bigger issue, I mean, you could still get some other illness that could still right. cause a lot of problems for you that are unrelated. So, you know, we get so hung up on the Lyme piece, but, you know, I think, again, collectively, we're thinking about all these different things that ticks carry. So again, yeah, when I hear about a tick bite, uh, I say treat sooner than later. And whether it's antibiotics, herbs, that's between you and your practitioner. Right. Uh, but there is, I, I would definitely be proactive in, in treating it. And, you know, circling back briefly to Lori's comment about too many false negatives, the other thing is um, having been sort of on the forefront of identifying Borrelia miyamotoi in the United States and publishing, you know, for the first 24 cases that we saw in this country, one of the things I find interesting is I just uh, had a case of acute Borrelia miyamotoi uh, clinical and lab confirmed. I went to send it into the state of Connecticut. And I looked and from January through July of this year, no cases had been reported. And I'm like, what is going on? Because like, so I, clearly I was in the process of reporting that case. So they're aware of it. But when you look, when we first learned, you know, Borrelia miyamotoi had been um, first uh, published in humans to be a human pathogen in February, 2012 by a Russian group. And I think they had like 46 or 47 people in the study, something like that. And, th and this is the first time, but they said for 20 plus years before that, we knew that it was in the same tick that gives you Lyme, anaplasm, babesiosis, but we didn't trans, we didn't think it transmitted. So now we're seeing that Borrelia miyamotoi is transmitted. So what was interesting was here we are, we publish this in the US, so we've got something just over 70 cases in the world. And within a year, they had gone back and looked at blood that was stored all the way back to 1992, and we found like 150 some more cases, and then wait another six months or a year, we've got another 150 more cases that are found in these samples that were stored. And so what had happened was these people came in, you know, they, it seems like they have Lyme disease, they've got some symptoms, but their blood tests are negative. So, oh, I guess you don't have Lyme disease, whatever, whatever. We come to find out that they were right. They didn't have Lyme disease, but they had Borrelia miyamotoi, which is almost the same thing, but it's not. So the blood test was negative because they were looking for the wrong organism, you know, and, you know, one of the reviews that was done in the last couple of years was going like, oh, there's no confirmation of, of co-infection transmission in a tick. I'm like, how does people do people who put Yale or, or Mass General after their name really believe this? I mean, they're publishing some of the papers. I mean, there's papers all over the place. I mean, you know, I, I when I'm going to do, you know, the, the uh, co-infections lecture at the Lyme Fundamentals in the fall at ILADS. And it's like been doing it for years now. You know, it's an hour long lecture. I've got hundreds of references, including like I've got like, you know, 10 minutes of just slide after slide after slide supporting co-infection. Right. And the problem and Yale published on it. I mean, we know this is real. And it's like, why do we one week say there's co-infection the next week it's like we can't transmit it we can't have that and it's like you know 
and I'm getting, I'm a little frustrated because, you know, and I know that the Yale paper came out after the first paper I'm talking about and give them a hard time, but it's like, you could say something more realistic, like, hey, these ticks carry multiple pathogens. We don't have a lot of evidence of humans getting multiple infections at one time. They tend to present with one or the other, rarely with two. And, you know, at least then you sound like a reasonable person to me, you know? And so it's just, I would love to see us going down that path of, um, you know, that, like I say, I, I love to talk about the pendulum to way far to the right and way, way far to the left. I just think we need to come in the middle, have a little bit of a lane so that we have a little flexibility in either direction, but just like, let's get in the middle because that's where our patients are living. Right. After this fighting on the fringes, let's bring it back down and become patient centered again. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, Cindy uh, comments here. My mom has rheumatoid arthritis and feet pain, the severe in Connecticut. Doctor won't even look for Lyme, so severe, not sure it can uh, be treated at this point. God, I'm sorry, Cindy. Uh, I've seen so many cases of RA that uh, my patients test positive for Lyme. And in some cases, again, it's been years since they've started developing symptoms. At that point, their joints are deformed. Uh, at that point, I've not seen anyone that was able to undo it. So, but I mean, you can still help improve. I mean, if Lyme is part of the case, I think there's still work that can be done to help improve her quality of life, to help reduce inflammation, may at least halt the st the progress of what's going on. But yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a common thing. I mean, RA, lupus, uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. I've seen all these, you know, classic autoimmune diseases in some cases, certainly not all, though, that are related to Lyme. Yeah, and I've certainly seen, you know, some cases that are reversible and some that aren't. And there's some permanent damage and some, you know, and there's reversible damage. But again, like, I think highlighting what you just said, Darren, is the halting the progression, if that's possible, can be amazing. You know, it's just like, you know, the use of low dose naltrexone in Parkinson's. I mean, some people have these miracle reversals and stuff, but particularly in Parkinson's, I, when I review the literature, it looks like more common than not, it stops it from getting worse. So if you can stop whatever your disease is from getting worse, that's not too bad. I mean, yeah. it could be better, but that's pretty damn good in these diseases that are known to be, you know, progressively worsening throughout the course of your life. If you can halt it, I mean, you know. It's better than the alternative. Yeah. Uh, Chris has a comment here. Uh, when you and your child or loved one falls ill with Lyme, time is of the essence in treating it. And unfortunately, most people like myself don't know much about Lyme until it hits home. Yeah, I think as a caregiver for a child or a partner who's dealing with Lyme, uh, it's really, really challenging. And uh, my best advice is, you know, be as supportive and helpful as you can. Uh, you, you, it's hard to experience with someone who's dealing with the Lyme symptoms has, but you don't have to necessarily have that experience to understand that, you know, you can do a lot to help them supportive. I find a lot of spouses in particular or partners, you know, help do the research, help, you know, connect them with other practitioners. So you can certainly be a very helpful integral part of their journey just by being supportive and, and helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing, too, is some of the doctors I know who treat these things, um, you know, Lyme, co-infections, pandas, the whole nine yards, they're like, I didn't believe it until it happened to my kid, right? And I don't want that to happen to anybody. So that's one of the things, the more we can get the information out to the, you know, to the general population, the more we can educate our schools. So a lot of the times when I partner with parents to do these letters for the school, I, I, I give a little extra in order to help do that. And, and, you know, and also I know some parents who are going out of their way, not only to work with their child, but also to support the school in learning more to help other kids. I try to give them the resources because I know they're going to put them out in the community. I mean, and there's a lot of docs doing this. And, and certainly like, I know both of us are working on different practitioner training programs that have different focuses, but, you know, the reason we both are doing this is so that we can get the information out to your doctors and they can share it with their colleagues and stuff. And so um, even recently, I've been, you know, talking to the local residency program. Um, I used to teach with them and then they went through some changes in the uh, in people who were working there and their administration. And so we just kind of, you know, didn't reconnect. But I want to reconnect and teach the residents because that it's not we could prevent a lot of this chronic Lyme if we could actually just treat people, diagnose them correctly in the beginning and treat them right in the beginning. So 
the more that we can get good information, you know, like Lori's talking about PubMed for research is a great resource. You know, the more and more we get good information to people and, you know, like I try when I do like, I, you know, I don't get blog posts out too frequently, but on the website, uh, you know, I try to make sure I list the, the references so that if you're reading an article and you think it's, it, it's something that would be helpful, you can share it with your physician because they can actually refer to the, to the data behind it and they don't have to do the PubMed research, you know, because we're busy, you know, I, I mean, and, and your primary care provider, I mean, some of these docs are seeing patients, you know, every five or 10 minutes, which is like, that's a ludicrous amount of people in a day, but they're, they're trying to serve so many people and they have to. So if we can give them like the cliff notes and we can give them short things. So when we bring them a stack of papers on the, on a patient, maybe we give them a couple of resources. You know, and if they want more, offer more or give them good papers that have like great references, you know, but, you know, it, it, it's like always partnering with your with your doctor. And I always I, I try to say if it's if it's very adversarial, you might need to get a, a new uh, provider. But I think it's it's important to walk in with an open mind and say, I think my son or my daughter might have this. I think I might have this. And you know, see what they have to say. And then if they're like, well, I heard about this as a bunch of BS or whatever, say, well, actually, you know, I thought so too. And still I, until I started reading and I saw there are a lot of other people who had these symptoms and actually got a lot better or completely cured when they were treated. And I found that this, these two articles were really helpful. Would you mind just skimming them? You know, because I mean, you know, I, I want to work with you and, you know, we have this great relationship, but my son, you know, my son, my daughter is, is suffering. Right. And that was one of the things like Dr. Horowitz always taught me. We, we need, you know, focus on what's the most important thing. Our goal is to alleviate suffering and to help a person get better. You know, it doesn't, and it doesn't matter what the name is all the time. So I just think going in, in a, in a friendly, you know, grateful manner to the providers and sharing information with them. And the same thing goes for like the school. I mean, you know, and even if you're someone who's a religious and active in your church, you could share this, with like a pastor or somebody else, so, you know, so that the word be creative again with getting the word out, you know, start with people close to you that you care about and care about you. And maybe they think you're a little nuts, but you give them just a little bit of the research and then you can really start to see that grow. Awesome. Uh, Chris also comments here. My daughter has been sick for a year, tried three rounds of antibiotics with no success. Now on Zhang protocol for five months, did great for first few months. Now she's declining quickly, possible seizures, uh, nausea, fatigue, starting to lose faith. Yeah, look, uh, Chris, I, we all understand it's so frustrating when you see this, you know, glimmer of hope that, you know, you're on the mend or you're... Ch your, your, your daughter's on the mend and then we start to see this relapse. Um, I think it'd be hard for us to comment on kind of what to do about it at this point without knowing more about her case. But, uh, you know, having, you know, periods of relapse is not uncommon. Uh, whoever you're working with, you know, who's helping you guide on that, if anybody, uh, it may mean that she needs a change in her protocol or maybe it's a, a something else that's been going on. But uh, that is not the typical course to have a little bit of a relapse. I've seen sometimes it lasts a week, maybe a little bit longer, but if it's going on longer than that, then there may be something that needs to change in the course of treatment. So yeah, definitely talk to your provider about that. Yeah. I mean, great, great suggestions. And I think that like, sometimes I go, well, are the symptoms the same as they were? Or are they a little different? Did, did we uncover another co-infection? Do we uncover another toxic insult, another issue? But yeah, definitely, you know, go back to that. And I certainly see people need rotation and changes in their protocol. And sometimes we just kind of, you know, get on a cruise control. And I'm sure I've been guilty of this at time where everything was looking good. And I was kind of like, whoo, all right. I'm really glad they're doing all right. So let's kind of kick back and see what we can get out of this. And then, you know, we kind of right, miss it by, you know, four weeks when we needed to make some shifts. So yeah, sitting down and reassessing, and always like when I, what my training as a resident was like assess, reassess, reassess, come up with a, a diagnosis, but continue, even when you have a diagnosis that you think is the right one, continue to keep your, you know, take the blinders off, make sure because other things happen. I mean, I've seen lots of kids who have Lyme disease and then they go and they were doing great and then they get worse. And then like, you know, in October, you know, but they were great for the last nine months. And in October, when they go to school, they get exposed to strep 
And now they have like a panda situation on top of Lyme that was healing. And the problem in those situations is you can get new symptoms, but also if you have a separate infective, infectious insult, especially if it's triggering autoimmunity, then you can have it, you know, flare up the, the similar, if not the same symptoms, but it could be a different thing because it's like your body's damaged. Now we just added more inflammation. So definitely reassess. Yeah. I mean, when I see people who are on any treatment and all of a sudden they tank very quickly, it makes me wonder again, was there something else that happened? Some other stressor? Uh, stress is probably one of the biggest things I see that seemed to undermine people's treatment. Um, something else going on, new mold exposure. I mean, there could be any number of different things. So again, that's just digging a little deeper to see if there's something else that may have happened that's kind of shifted the the tide. Uh, Diane comments here. Let's see. I'm on Byron White protocol, treating one bacteria at a time. Is that a good way to do it? Or do you treat Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia all at once? Uh, specifically for Byron White, if people have multiple infections, we'll treat them all simultaneously. So, yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it's like, I, I, I usually try to la layer things and I do it. I, you know, my protocols are interesting because I think someone, it might've been Diane asked about your protocols. And I know a lot of your general approach to the protocols are in your book. Um, I haven't gotten my book done because I didn't get it started yet. So you have to wait for my <laughs> you have to wait for my herbal protocols for a little bit, but you don't always call. But but one of the things is, you know, I remember I was talking to Susan McCamish from um, Beyond Balance a couple years ago because I use a lot of their products, especially in kids. But I said she was asking me how I, you know, because my one of my first cases of Borrelia miyamotoi, I started on AL complex of Byron White and I started on artemisinin essentials, which is liposomal artemisinin and she was doing great. And then she, she sort of regressed and I said, Oh, let's add in MCBB2. And, and then it was like off to the races. She was great. You know, like a year later, she's spectacular, you know, and what was really interesting about our conversation was I said, you know, she's like, how are you treating um, Borrelia Miyamoto? I said, well, I did this, I did that, I did that. And I'm combining products from all different lines because I found what did we need to layer together to get the best effect, you know? And AL is great, but BB2 does treats Lyme and Borrelia Mimotoi seemingly a little bit different of an angle and liposomal artemisinin in it covers Babesia, it helps with Lyme, it helps with Bartonella, and it also helps rip open biofilms being liposomal with some EDTA in it. But then those two other formulas, like the AL and the MCBB2, it's not like they exclusively have Lyme only herbs in them. Right. Which is one of the things I love about herbal protocols. So I generally, if I'm gonna, I, I, I tend to see people that if I do AL, ABAB and ABART, I'll blow them up. But if I do AL, MC, BAR2 and artemisinin, I get, I get much better response, at least in the people who come see me. So yeah. I, I tend to mix and match a lot. And when I first studied Byron White with um, Wayne Anderson, he, you know, he was at least at that time not suggesting layering too many at one time. And if you were going to put them on top of each other, at least spreading them out so that you could see. And just for me, I find it easier to just take, you know, different products. And certainly I use, you know, research nutritional, supreme nutrition, you know, um, Nutramedics, some Zong herbs, like the whole nine. I mean, so it's all on the table, but that's just an example of how I might sort of layer things so that, um, they're coming from a different a different herbalist is putting them together so they work a little differently and the energetics of, and the synergy of the combinations are coming from somebody else's mind a little bit so that we're getting a little i love kind of like coming at it from different angles all at once yeah no i was going to make the same comment i mean you know uh, that's the beauty of herbs is that you can mix and match them you know depending on your desired goal because some of these herbs are more anti-inflammatory some of them target different organisms a little bit better than others some of them help promote better circulation some of them help break up immune complexes so you get a lot of these additional benefits with herbs and if you understand what each of the herbs are doing individually then you can mix and match and yeah i do the same thing with my patients i'll find which formulas work best but i do still treat them simultaneously. Oh, I think yeah. realistically, if you're trying to deal with Lyme by itself, but you still have Rickettsia, Bartonella going on, right? you're, you're going to get minimal benefit by just kind of only addressing one. And what's interesting is I think a lot of these herbs, there is a lot of overlap. You know, I know Byron White, you know, he names his formulas, you know, based on Lyme, Bartonella, but in reality, there's a lot of crossover between the herbs. So I'm sure, you know, right. the A-Bart is still helping Lyme and the yeah, A-Bart exactly. is It's just, you know, so, well, you know, 
And the reason I, that I mentioned Susan that I, I almost forgot to finish my thought, but it was like, Susan was like, that's exactly what we need to be doing is combining different things and finding the best thing for the patient. And I just find that this is one of the places in medicine that apparent competitors like you and I, or Susan and Byron, everybody's like, let's work together. Let's combine our stuff because together we can do more work. And I mean, these are like, you know, two of the biggest, you know, antimicrobial herbal people in the field. And they're just like, yeah, let's put it all, let's do it, man. Let's get it because it's for the patient. And it's just so inspiring because, you know, like as we've talked in all of the times we've done these and, and even tonight, I mean, it's like there's sometimes they do feel hopeless, but it's like even the companies that are trying to get you better and are and are vying for you to use their product. They're like, hey, you know what? If we get people better by combining our stuff, that's even better for everybody. Win, 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 win. And it's just like a, such a great place to be because everybody in the group is trying to find a way to get you or your loved one better. Exactly. Uh, Ken makes a comment here, post-treatment Lyme diagnosis, recent CBC with different results, low white count, red count, hematocrit, hemoglobin, lymphocytes, two tests, six weeks apart, taking iron supplements in between both, cause for concern. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, again, unfortunately, that's again, that's not as much information as I think either one of us would really like to really get an assessment. And again, we're not here to, to diagnose everybody, but uh, yeah, definitely you want to follow up with your doctor. Uh, if you've got two tests six weeks apart, they're still showing low hemoglobin, hematocrit, you're anemic, your white count's low. Uh, there's got to be a reason why. So you just got to dig a little deeper and figure out what that right. why is. And I, and I think one of the um, things that I think is super important to understand is Lyme and Babesia. Um, well, in this case, maybe more like anaplasmosis or um, Borrelia miyamotoi and Babesiosis could bring down your white cells and your red cells, but there's also a hell of a lot of other things that can do that, particularly when you're low in iron. Although if you have Babesia and you're hemolyzing your iron or whatever, you could, I mean, your, your uh, red cells, you could be losing yep. your iron. Lots of stuff that go in there, but one of the things I would just suggest is that unfortunately, things like post, you know, like chronic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme or whatever you have, plus other things in your life could happen. So, you know, and I think I probably mentioned this on one of our, you know, talks before. I mentioned it a lot. I had somebody come up from Florida because they had brain fog, fatigue, and joint pain after, and their doctor had checked them for an ELISA because they, he went in and told me, his wife told me he had Lyme or something like that. And the guy's like, look, you don't have Lyme, you know, whatever, go about your business. He comes up to see me. I do a comprehensive workup looking for all those other possibilities. And I find out that he has a, a thyroid stimulating hormone of 97 when it should be like 0.4 to four and a half. And so he was profoundly hypothyroid. I put him on thyroid medication and within three weeks, like all of his symptoms have normalized. So Lyme is the great imitator. And so, but that also means because it can look like other things, you can accidentally think Lyme is causing something that, it, that else, you know, because it can look the same. So just look, you know, have, don't, don't go in and tell your doc you have Lyme. I mean, go in and say, hey, I think I might have post-treatment Lyme or I might have, um, you know, chronic Lyme or whatever, but also be open to all of it because my goal and O'Darren's goal is for you to be better. Everybody comes to my office. I really could care less what diagnosis they have. I strongly feel we should figure it out and know what it is so we can help them get better. But right. in the end, I'm not attached to that diagnosis. I want you to feel better. And I and and you know, if if I can tell you that you have hypothyroidism and you need to take nature throid or tyrosine for the rest of your life, as opposed to needing to deal with chronic Lyme disease for five years, I mean that's awesome, right? So it's just one of those things. Just be open to the possibilities. Um, but yeah. definitely get it checked out. Absolutely. And I think sometimes, yeah, we get our, our we hang our hat that everything's Lyme related. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is. It's a thyroid problem. It's an adrenal issue. It's a reproductive hormone problem. So I think, you know, Tom and I are both very diligent about, you know, always checking for all the other things it can be too, because again, that's going to take you down a very different treatment path. So, you know, if you feel like you're getting stuck in your treatments, like, gosh, I've been on Lyme treatment, I'm still having fatigue or this and that, you know, make sure you're working with the provider to start exploring all these other possibilities, because it's not uncommon that that happens too. Right. 
Yeah, and it looks like we have a couple comments. I mean, Tyler Joyce, um, somebody else is in there talking. I think, Lori, well, yeah, and Lori and stuff. But um, some of the questions are about, like, I hear lime, you know, from Joyce, lime goes with mold and heavy metals, you know, and then how does that kind of work together? And then also Tyler's bringing up pandas and mold and high viral load. So I think that, um, and then I think we should also circle back to Lori's question. But I think that, that they're an important topic to consider. Um, so what do you think? I mean, lime goes hand in hand with mold and heavy metals. Well, I think, you know, with mold in particular, there's a lot of clinical overlap in people that have got mycotoxicity. Uh, I mean, I think if you wrote down all the symptoms of mycotoxicity and all the symptoms of Lyme, there's probably an 80, 85 percent right. overlap. So I, for me, that's always at the top of my list when I have a new patient coming in and we're exploring Lyme. Often we're, I just now kind of routinely explore for mold because, again, it takes us down a very different treatment path. And clinically, it can be difficult to distinguish. Uh, heavy metal toxicity for me is never at the top of my list. We are all exposed to heavy metals. If you live on the planet Earth, you're exposed. If you do any kind of you know, provoked urine test, as an adult anyway, you will come back inevitably with something that's probably elevated. You know, The problem with the test is it doesn't tell you how much it actually bothers you. And I find clinically, when we put people through chelation therapy, maybe it's 10%, 15% of people that clinically report that they feel a lot better when they go through chelation therapy. So it hasn't been the majority of my patients. So therefore, it's kind of at the low end of the totem pole for me as things we need to investigate. But when we're doing a lot of other things and people haven't responded, it's right. on, on the list. Unless they've had a known toxic exposure to lead or mercury or something that's very blatant. Sure. Um, so it's, for me, it's not at the top of my list. It's interesting because for me, it, I try to make it the top of my list because it was a huge impact on me but um, it falls short of the top of the list all the time anyway, you know? And so the thing is like from where I live, you know, we're on the East coast. I mean, so people get Lyme disease and people live in and around mold. I mean, it's just around. So it's like, you know, and I think that like just because you have mold toxicity or you're exposed to mold doesn't mean that you have Lyme or you're going to get Lyme. I mean, certainly if you have really bad mold toxicity, and then you go and get bitten by a tick and then injects Lyme in you, I would think that it's possible that your body's a bit suppressed and you wouldn't be able to fight it off as good as you could if you didn't. Um, but yeah, the, the clinically they overlap, treatment's really different. Dovetailing in the kind of what Ta Tyler was talking about, I see a lot of kids who either if they have candida or they have a mold exposure, you know, both of which are fungi, are we're run we do end up um, – I see that a lot of our antifungal treatments appear to be very immune modulating. So yeah. a lot of the behavioral stuff that I see in pans, pandas kids, when I'm not getting it under control, I have to go back, you know, maybe they have a known strep exposure, a known Bartonella that triggered their pans, you know, it, but you still got to go back and go, am I making candida, you know, with my treatment is their lifestyle before meeting me, has it led to candida or other, you know, yeast, but also is there a mold exposure? Because so much the AFNG, the mycorrhigin from the two companies we talked about, as well as many of the other treatments and even, and binders too. I mean, they can make such a huge difference in these children with autoimmune encephalitis. And so I do see a big overlap there. And the part about heavy metals that I think is important is I had a ton of mercury amalgams I totally don't agree with anybody getting mercury in their mouth because like if you ask your dentist what would happen if they took your filling out and threw it in the trash, they would tell you they'd be fined. And if they did it too many times, they'd end up in jail, right? So, but it's okay to put it in your mouth. So I wouldn't recommend going out and getting them. But what I, but there is this concept of, you know, after you get Lyme, it, you know, I was fine before I got Lyme. You know, my brain worked just fine with all these mercury fillings. I got Lyme. I, I got and, you know, it was a long time before somebody got the right diagnosis. I finally got treated for Lyme and Babesia and I was feeling really good, but I, I never got like that complete resolution of my brain fog and stuff. And right. so, and just the mental stamina wasn't there. So then I looked into the heavy metals and my mercury was like through the ceiling, but it appeared that it was making a big difference for me. You know, like it was clinically impacting me because all the other Lyme things had gone away. And so chelation actually helped me quite a bit, but there's this this concept of cryptopyroluria, you know, where Lyme may be able, as well as other major uh, physical or emotional traumas, trigger 
you know, quiescent sort of genetic pathways and you can start to lose more minerals than you would have otherwise and potentially then hold on to more of the metals. I mean, Dr. Klinghart's talked about it for a long time. You know, I don't know that it's the be all end all that needs to be in the, the cor in, in, as a cornerstone of our treatment protocols. But I just have, you know, like you were saying, Darren, there's a point where you've done the other stuff and you're stuck and, you know, you got to look there. And this is why seeing a doctor who understands how to look at the whole picture is important because in certain people, heavy metals is critical and other people, it might not be a big deal. So we have been trained and certainly through our experience, learn how to prioritize these things because if you were to do a Lyme treatment and a mold treatment and a Barnella treatment and a viral treatment and reboot your gut, redo your diet, start an exercise program, <laughs> you know, do heavy metal chelation. I mean, you, you know, the only food you're going to eat is a pill and you're going to just sleep all day after your exercise, you know, so that's not realistic. So, um, but what do you think about Lori's question? Uh, positive rickettsia not been treated in the past for the past 10 years. Um, uh, I would, I would treat it. <laughs> yeah i mean you know a lot of these uh, cold infections you know that go on for years and never get treatment uh, again i think the nature of most bacteria is that it, even if it hasn't been treated i mean you can still treat it now uh you know better late than never so um i, I think it's the same whether you're dealing with lyme rickettsia bartonella babesia different organism but some more kind of problem is that you know you've got that initial infection that causes its own set of damage but then beyond that you know most of these tick-borne illnesses do have the disposition to triggering more of an autoimmune kind of problem so you know i i haven't seen as much rickettsia as you know some of the other co-infections i mean i've seen it certainly with bartonella with lyme babesia anaplasma uh, so I would imagine the rickettsia has that disposition as well. So I think it's also important for someone who's had these prolonged tick-borne illnesses that you're looking at that autoimmune aspect. And, you know, you start look, working on things that are immune modulators, uh, immunotherapy, and things like that. They're actually going to start shifting the immune system away from that, that TH2-driven pathway that really drives allergy and autoimmunity. Yeah. Then you know, the other thing is, it's interesting when you have to understand when if you're looking at the lab testing, is it an IgM, is it an IgG, you know, and the other thing like, like she was saying is like, are we missing something, you yeah. know, or, or I mean, I should say it hasn't been treated before because we haven't treated it before. That's different than we treated it and we have a persistent IgG because, you know, in Lyme Western blots, that IgG may stay there for your whole life or it may start to go away and we don't know who you are until we retest you. Borrelia miyamotoi, we're not sure. I see people where I clear it. I see people where I don't clear it, even though they've been asymptomatic. Um, anaplasma, I mean, we think, I mean, it should clear. Babesia, it should clear, but sometimes they don't. And it doesn't necessarily confirm active infection. Whereas if you look at the right titer for Bartonella henselae, we know that that IgM is often fleeting and an IgG being elevated you know, to the proper level of like one to 256 or greater in, in most conventional tests, like Galaxy and Igenix don't follow the, that particular, um, you know, tighter schedule, but they have their own re re reference yeah. range. But that's the typical range. That's cons that IgG by the book is consistent with recent or active infection. So a lot of, and sometimes we have to educate, like I've had shared patients with neurologists who just don't, they're like, oh, IgG is old. Well, usually it's old, but not always, right? And so we have to understand those things. So that's just another piece is to, you know, speak with your provider about what organism it is and what do the tests actually mean. So. Right. Uh, Lori asks here, have you ever had anyone have an allergic reaction to the herbal treatment? Uh, well, I guess to find what allergic reaction is. Anaphylactic, uh, not that I've ever seen. I've uh, been treating thousands and thousands of patients with herbs. I have some people who don't tolerate the herbs. So if that's what you're defining as allergic reaction, that does happen for some people. Think of it just like foods. You know, some people tolerate certain foods or another. These are plants. Uh, sometimes it's a function of the plant. Sometimes it's a function of how the plant is prepared. Sometimes people can handle the raw herb and not the tincture and vice versa. So uh, it can and does happen. I'd say it's fairly uncommon, uh, but it, it can happen. Yeah, I think I've seen one person in like over 12 years. 
And she was, and I mean, she swells, but she also has anaphylaxis to a fair number of things. And there was probably something else triggering a lot of it, but she would get like swelling in the mouth and stuff, but it was a combination herb that had something in it that, that we thought we had cleared that wasn't in there. And then we, but it was in there, took some Benadryl, got it early and was good. But yeah, I mean, almost I've very well tolerated for most people. Yeah. And for people who are highly sensitive, I mean, the rule is always low and slow. Start with a small amount, you know, increase your dose slowly as you feel like you're tolerating. You can always go up. That's really easy. Worst thing is if you go in too high, too hard, you blow yourself out of the water, you start herxing like crazy. And then now we have to wait for everything to quiet down before we can kind of revisit it. Yeah. So I'd rather just go easy and make sure people tolerate things first. Uh, Ellen asked, um, how do you treat EBV? Refer them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I use some herbal combinations from some of the people we talked about. I find that they actually usually work better and quicker than the meds. I mean, I certainly have treated some people with Valcite um, and less commonly with Valtrex um, based on um, Jose Montoya's work um, out of Stanford and Dr. Lerner. I think he's up in Ohio or somewhere in the Midwest up there. You know, I've had some people where that nothing's working. They meet all the criteria for reactivated EBV, and I use some valcite, and you know, it it does work. But again, it's a small number of people. But certainly, meds and herbs, and ask your provider. But again, and I think going back to a lot of the things, I'm sure you'll say in a second, Darren, and to Sue's question, a lot of what we do with our is like, a, why is this virus actually reactivated? Why is it still persisting in the body when it should right. be dormant? What is the immune system not not doing? So, right. yeah, you know, Epstein Barr, you know, ninety percent of adults will show positive titers to this virus. Uh, so it's a it's a normal virus. It's part of you. It's an opportunistic infection, like a like you know, Candida can be opportunistic. Epstein Barr. So fundamentally, you know, typically when we see reactivation, something has happened in the body that's allowed for that activation to occur. You are never, ever, 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 ever going to get rid of this virus. So the concept of trying to kill the virus permanently, that's not going to happen. It's really about controlling the virus to at least to the point that your immune system starts to control it on its own. Yeah. You know, when you look at the research on antivirals, for Epstein Barr, most of it's been very disappointing, and it's not been very effective. In fact, I was I'm giving a lecture in Louisville in a few weeks, and I was reading all the new research on some of the new medications that they're targeting. It's interesting stuff, but there's nothing that's even close to coming to market anytime in the next probably five years. So that's way down the line. But in the meantime, I think it's about you know the fundamental things about you know what are you eating. How much are you sleeping? How are you taking care of yourself? How are you mastering your stress? You know, these are often the things that make the biggest difference with Epstein-Barr, I find. There are some really great herbal antivirals, things like andrographis have been very effective. Uh, Lomatium has been very effective. Usnea, we've got a lot of really cool antiviral herbs that I find seem to work a little bit better than the medication. I've tried, you know, Valtrex and Valside and Gancyclovir and some of these and eh, no mixed results, but I'm never also doing that by itself. You know, we're always doing yeah, that no style thing. So um, I think, you know, ultimately the way you get Epstein-Barr under control is you got to control all these other lifestyle factors. Yeah. And uh, Sue asked, uh, oh, hey, Sue. <laughs> uh, what are some treatment examples of immune modulators when dealing with autoimmune issues? So immune modulators come in different forms. There are some herbs that are actually immune modulators. Uh, resveratrol is actually an immune modulator. Uh, we've got other, uh, uh, gosh, I'm like drawing a blank now that some of our big immune modulators, a lot of the mushroom extracts, right. these like shiitake, reishi, maitake are immune modulators. Uh, grapefruit seed extract, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, not grapefruit seed, uh, grape seed extract. So like pycnogenol, uh, French maritime bark, that's a known immune modulator. Uh, we do a lot with immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is a way of modulating the immune system. So whether you're doing sublingual immunotherapy, low-dose allergy therapy, all this is a way of retraining your immune system to stop overreacting right. to, you know, 
food, mold, pollen. Uh, we do LDI, low dose immunotherapy for bacteria and viruses. So that's been a very effective part of our uh, practice in helping you know turn off that overreaction of the immune system. And that's what a lot of these reactions are. They're really overreactions. Your immune system's reacting to something that's a normal part of your world. So we just want to retrain it to stop doing that. So that's a few examples. Yeah, and I mean, LDN is certainly another one, I'm sure. Yep. I, I know you use a fair amount too. So low dose naltrexone can be utilized. I mean, what is your um, experience with like CBD oil? I mean, it's kind of like all the rage now. And I find that I think it kind of probably does more work as a anti-inflammatory, but. Yeah, yeah, that's been my experience. I mean, again, you know, measuring whether your immune's modulated, we don't really have a good blood test that does that. So this is all stuff that's done in a research lab, but. Yeah, I, CBD, I, again, I don't know it as much as an immune modulator, but definitely yeah. as an anti-inflammatory. I think everything else, you know, cannabinoid receptors do for the brain and the body are generally good. I find CBD is pretty well tolerated. Uh, right. It's just a function of, you know, what company, what dose. That varies pretty widely from person to person. And now everyone, in, you know, I'm in California where, you know, marijuana is legal. So we have a thousand companies making CBD and right. medical marijuana products that well, what company is better than others? I don't know. What's your experience been? Because like for me, I've had people use sort of medical marijuana CBD and then hemp CBD, with does, which doesn't have the psychoactive THC. And across the board, I would say... God, it's got to be more than, I mean, again, like I don't keep records on it, but it's got to be way above 90% of people do better on the over-the-counter hemp CBD concentrate than they do on medical marijuana, at least, you know, in my practice, especially the kids with light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, social anxiety, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I well, I can't prescribe medical marijuana, so I don't. But I find, again, most people I work with do really well on CBD. I think the biggest differing factor is just the dose. I think a lot of people tend to underdose CBD. And because yeah. it's expensive, they're trying to save it and make it last longer, but they're also not getting to a therapeutic dose. I have seen, you know, the preparation to have some THC, particularly for kids with seizures, often they do really oh, yeah, for sure. the THC combination. But for anxiety, stress, insomnia, I find CBD on its own with that, you know, less than 0.03% THC actually does quite well. Yeah. And I think what I found, and I probably learned it the hard way is like, you got to get that dose right. Like, like you're saying, I mean, it, you know, I did, I find that in the adults, you really got to be 25 milligrams twice a day and kids, depending upon their size, you know, you know, the average young teen tween is even 15 milligrams twice a day. And if I go now, there's a few people who need to be a little lower and it works great. But a lot of people, if I don't get them to some number right around those, it's it's a waste of their money and it's a waste of their time put it in their mouth. Yeah, I'm sure it's doing something, but they're just not seeing that big benefit, you know, so. Yeah, there's a, a really guy, a cool neurologist down in Florida. Tyler knows him, uh, Dr. Ronald Onding, A-U-N-G hyphen D-I-N. He's a neurologist that's been studying uh, CBD, mostly in children with autism. But he's been finding by rubbing CBD on the nape of the back of the neck that he's getting higher concentration into the brainstem. Uh, which is pretty fascinating. So I think, you know, I've been having a lot of people, instead of just doing oral CBD, rub a little bit to the back of the neck if we want to get more of a neurological effect. And it nice. seems to be working pretty well. And I'll try that before bed tonight and I'll get back <laughs> to you on that. <laughs> you know, what's interesting though is um, I see some people who are really hyper reactive to the herbs, uh, especially the extracts and the tinctures that you can actually put them on topically to start them off and they see clinical benefit and then they're able to get it in kind of, you know, orally after that and tolerate it a lot better. And then, yeah. you know, so and topical is an interesting thing for me too, because I use, I'll use um, doxycycline on swollen knees that don't go down after treatment, but just topically. So keep it in mind. It's, it's not a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can use transdermally that work actually really well. And I think yeah, CBD just happens to be one of them. Yeah. Uh, Chris asks, can Artemisia 2, uh, that's a Dr. Zhang formula cause seizures. Uh, there is no research showing Artemisia causes seizures. I have not seen it in my own clinical practice, but I will always say that everyone's unique and different. And if there's ever a concern, stop it. Just 
to make sure, but uh, there's no literature out there suggesting artemisia causes seizures. It's actually a very, very safe herb. And the artemisia formula that Dr. Zhang has, just as a FYI, is not the same as pure artemisinin. There are some companies that make a pure artemisinin product. Uh, this is artemisia. This is the whole herb. It is not concentrated artemisinin. Oh, nice. there, there's a handful of cases. I think there's 14 cases of pure artemisinin that started causing liver problems. I have uh, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so pure artemisinin, that is a, 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 a caution. But with whole artemisia, that's never been reported. So, um, yeah, I've not seen that or seen anything written about it. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when you do see liver, you know, acute hepatitis from it, it's, it's sketchy. I mean, it's like, they call you up and it's like Coca-Cola urine Yeah, and liver functions in the three, four hundreds. And then you stop and it goes right down, but Oh my God, it's one of the scariest calls and pictures I ever received. So yeah. <laughs> I, again, I mean, I've been using it in the liposomal form for years and years and years and years, uh, approaching a decade now. And I've only seen it one time but everybody's an individual, you know, and there's only 14 cases, but man, when that 14th case is the person that you gave it to, holy cow. Yeah. Look, you know, I, I, I know so many uh, cases now of, you know, not just my own, but other, you know, practitioners that do very well intended treatments to just backfire spectacularly. And it just speaks to the nature of how individual we are. And if you've been trying a treatment, you've been having a negative result, don't feel like you have to suffer through it. I had a patient right. come in a day that's been suffering through this treatment for three months now because their doctor just assured them at some point they're going to get better. I'm like, dude, at three months, you, you're past that point. You know, you're not through like a, a healing crisis or herx. This is something completely different. Yeah. You can stop the treatment and reevaluate. So. so speaking of Herxheimer's, I mean, what are you telling people for duration? What is a real Herxheimer versus some other kind of weird reaction? A real Herxheimer should be a matter of days up to maybe about a week or so, maybe 10 days tops. If it's lasting two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, it's probably not a Herx. You're probably having a reaction to whatever you're doing and you need to reevaluate. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, Diane, is coconut oil good for getting rid of Lyme also? Uh, coconut oil has some antimicrobial effects, mostly anti-fungal uh, because of the caprylic acid content. I'm not sure with Lyme how well it would do. Um, I've never used it for that particular purpose. So, I don't know, Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I'm kind of with you on that one. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking more of if it does work in Lyme, it's it's working on other stuff. You know, I mean, there's so much evidence right, for, the, for the antifungal, but then also just getting it in as a dietary fat, I mean, to support, you know, brain function and hormone function and all these other things. And um, also a lot of times adding coconut oil in, you take other things out too. Um, and it substitutes for some things that weren't so good. So, I mean, I think it's more indirect and certainly the antifungal is up there for me. Yeah. Uh, Lainey asks, oh, hey Lainey, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Uh, what is your take on SOT for Lyme treatment? Uh, I think you're talking about sacral occipital technique or SOT is it something different? I, yeah, I don't know. I know SOT is sacral occipital technique. Don't you use that in osteopathic medicine? Uh, we wouldn't call it that, but maybe. I don't know what SOT is. I don't know what sacral occipital technique is, but I certainly know that the central nervous system is in your brain and goes all the way down to the coccyx, which is on the, on the far end of your um, sacrum. So in some respects, yeah, maybe, um, maybe Lanny can shoot us a comment, what she's talking about to make sure that we uh, um, talk about it. But um, you know, I mean, for us, that might be serious overtime therapy, which I need to have <laughs> anti-SOT if that's the case. But I don't know. That'll be cool. I'll be looking forward okay, to that. Well, Lee, if you're still on and want to pop over a little clarification, that'd be awesome. Oh, Lisa. Hey, uh, Lisa. Lisa from Down Under. Hey, you just skipped over Elena. Hi, Elena. Woo oh, hi, Elena. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like trying to scroll through. So I know, Lisa, I know. she's going to start CBD tomorrow. Great. I hope it helps. Uh, again, yeah. I think it's uh, it helps a lot of folks. My dogs love it, man. <laughs> I'm serious. I have a dog who's 14 and a half and she's got horrible arthritis in her hips. She blew out her CCL, which is what would be our ACL yeah. running around the yard because she couldn't hear where we were and she crashed. And then I have a retired disaster search and rescue dog who's, you know, busted up his whole body, you know, going out there to, 
help other people. And, you know, and we've had real life deployments before he got retired and before we both retired from doing that. And man, he was starting to have a hard time getting up the stairs. And this is a dog that could jump over under and crawl through anything. He could run, he was trained to run up a human ladder. And so with the CBD, I just double, I, I bumped him from, you know, up to about 15 milligrams from about seven or eight. And it was, um, it was like two days later, it's running up and down. But one thing I will tell you guys for anybody who uses it with your animals, your animals can get messed up if they overdose on it. We accidentally dropped a two uh, uh, ounce bottle of CBD on the floor, which hurt the pocketbook more than anything. And we wiped it up with uh, paper towels and then we weren't looking, the dog went in and actually ate it. And then he, he was like laying on, falling off the porch, laying on the ground, his whole spine was shaking. And we went to the vet and they say in the dogs, not only are they getting people sharing their medical with the dogs, but if dogs get into too much um, high concentrated hemp with CBD, they can have very similar symptoms to, you know, as if they were high, even though there's no, there's almost no THC. And, and so ODing your animal by accident on CBD, you know, could lead to symptoms that, you know, you weren't expecting. Not that this is a veterinary medicine show, but I learned it the hard way. <laughs> They figured I'd share. All right. So we, we got uh, Samantha and Laney. Oh, there we go. So SOT, supportive oligonucleotide therapy. Darren? <laughs> I have not used it in my practice, so I can't comment. Yeah. Yet. I'll, you know, maybe remind us next time. I'll, I'll go take a look. But, yeah, it's not something that I'm familiar with. Um, I know that. You know, there, there's a whole, there's all kinds of stuff out there, you know, and it's just like, it's good to be having these conversations about the questions of what's up. I know that you've been looking at peptides a little bit. I don't know if you have an update on peptides in general. No, we have just started using peptide therapy in our office. And uh, I think it's a little early, too early to say, uh, you know, what the response has been, because I think you have to give it really a good three months to assess. We're about in month, you know, one, one and a half so, you know, we'll see how people start reporting back after doing some of these peptides. But I'm very excited about peptides. I think they have a lot of great potential to help uh, Lyme patients. So more to come on that. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know. I'm looking at I'm looking up a little of the other stuff and it, it's it's the support of a ligand uh, ligonucleotide therapy. I don't know. We'll have to, you know, there's a, like a lot of things there. It seems to be. um a lot of press from companies making the products and, and less coming up on PubMed, but there is a review. So um, although it is four years old, so I don't know, it'll be something to, to look after and I'll definitely keep my eyes and ears peeled as I comb the literature and, and go through. So maybe we can report back in the future because, you know, we got to keep our eyes and ears open, but then take our, you know, use our critical thinking caps for these things, you know, yeah, I mean, I hear about all sorts of new therapies, particularly that are done outside of the country. I know in Mexico, they've been doing dendritic cell therapy, which sounds really fascinating since dendritic cells are the part of the immune system that really confer kind of what's an allergen, what's not an allergen. I think right. if, if it does what I think it does, it might have a really amazing potential to modulate the immune system very quickly. Uh, I actually asked to go down to the clinic in Mexico and shadow and they told me no. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, does that mean you're trying to hide something or right. I don't want the bother? So I don't know. I don't have any experience with it yet, but uh, I think there are other things that are going to be coming down the pike that will ultimately start helping the immune system in a different way. Yeah. And I know exosomes are coming out. Everybody's talking about that. And you know, what's interesting though is, I, and I have friends who are doing like, you know, placental uh, stem cells and all this other stuff that a lot of these therapies work, but they're working for like a small number of people. And we need to figure out we, so I'm not saying don't use them, but what I'm saying is if there's a hundred people and three people it works for, let's find out what makes the, the it work for those three people. So we can identify the next six and 12 people who it'll benefit for not having, you know, so many people be exposed to things that they potentially don't need from, you know, uh, from immune challenges to financial stressors or whatever without that. And, and I think the thing I always come back to is there is a core group of things that usually work more well than they don't work for more people. So it's like, you know, what's, and we start there. Right. You know, 
I've had I had somebody call up the other day and go, hey, you know, um, I, I think I just got Lyme disease. Do you prescribe disulfiram? <laughs> Yeah, that's the the newest kid on the block, I think. I know, and right, and, you know, and it's cool because Ken Ligner did, published his three cases. He's what he's going to talk about at ILADS. We're you know, um, Brian Fallon at Columbia and some other colleagues are going to be doing a, a study on it. But we're doing it on people with chronic Lyme disease, you know, or something, you know, some other whatever they define chronic Lyme disease as. But that's the group of people. There is no substitute for early diagnosis and treatment of what you actually have and using a well-known, you know, treatment and protocol. Yeah. And so unfortunately I know that I'm, I'm, I feel bad because I, I don't want to come off saying like, Hey, you got to go to the middle. You always use this basic stuff, but the basics usually work. And I understand that a lot of people who are on our calls are going to be people who have gone through this. But when we're talking to other people, it's really hard not to say, Hey, you know what? I did X, Y, and Z super advanced Lyme therapy after five years of failed therapies and I got better. Well, those five years of failed Lyme therapies probably helped you get to the point where this advanced therapy worked. But a lot of people that you're talking to, they don't need all this crap. They just need to, you know, they're, they're hopefully, or at least hopefully they don't need it. They need to get to the beginning and, and start off with a good diagnosis and treatment to start with and then move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lori says here, uh, I have been su successfully treating the inflammatory components of Lyme and co-infections with MRT, LEAP protocol. You're certified in that lab, game changer, great. I think the MRT, uh, if I'm correct, uh, is uh, dealing with like the food allergy piece, isn't it, Lori? Please chime in if that's the case. I think that's what it does. Yeah, that's what it looks like when you look at it. Yeah, um, I think it's another way. I mean, yeah, anything you can do to reduce inflammation. I mean, I find a lot of my Lyme patients at some point, uh, often, at least in my clinic, we do look at food allergies, environmental allergies, chemical yeah. sensitivities, because we do a lot of immunotherapy. Again, there's a way we can desensitize people. And I find across the board, almost all my patients have been dealing with persistent Lyme have sensitivity to something. And this is the function of what it is and how we deal with it. But that's pretty, pretty common. Right. And, and then another... Well, it sounds like my fire alarm's trying to go off here. I guess I got to change the battery. Um, <laughs> very convenient. Um, the 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 one thing it, too is that we have to remember the or a lot of the organisms we're talking about have been found in the gut wall. So not only are we having to look at some dietary treatments to potentially help mod modulate the immune system and other microbiome and gut. Um, treatments, but we have to also look at the other possibility that um, there's an infection actually in the gut wall and an antimicrobial might be the thing that fixes your leaky gut. So just right. kind of another thing, because I know I'm um, skipping a couple people, but up to Bobby, there's thoughts on Terry Walls and her diet and lifestyle changes for chronic diseases. This seems like a pretty good, um, you know, segue. Well, uh, speaking as I just spoke at Dr. Wall's conference a few weeks ago, and actually Dr. Tom and I are both speaking there next year. And uh, I follow, uh, well, I mean, her diet and what I talk about in my book, an alkaline diet, are really kind of the same Very thing. similar, right? They're very, very similar. So this is the way I eat. Uh, gosh, I wish I could show you my refrigerator. You'd laugh. It's just like- Oh, dude, check out Darren's Instagram, man. It's like I salivate every time it comes up. <laughs> It's, like, oh, it's an awesome looking food. Uh, we, I'm like become a vegetable uh, freak. And, uh, but again, I think it's a very healthy diet. It's very anti-inflammatory. It's also moving your pH in the right direction, making your cells more alkaline so that they function better. It's applicable to any number of chronic illnesses, whether it's MS, Lyme, lupus, heart disease, take your pick. It's also uh, applicable to just general health and staying healthy. I mean, Absolutely. And uh, so many veggies. I just uh, took my test to be a certified walls practitioner. So I'm waiting for my results. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I mean, I know Terry quite well as you do, Tom. I'm like, I'm even really <laughs> if I flunk that test. <laughs> Hopefully I passed. Well, see, the good news is I'm not going there until next year to take that thing. So it'll be good. I have a whole year to prep. And so just give me some insider information. I mean, if there's any questions you get wrong, let me know. I'll study up. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a pretty straightforward test, so I think I did okay. But yeah, I think it's a great way to eat. Yeah, there was this one question I thought I heard about, like, you know, when in doubt do you choose a green smoothie or Coca-Cola? 
I wasn't sure what the answer was. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny, you know, going to Terry Wall's conference, the hotel she had the conference at really catered to her diet, which was amazing. Uh, but it was really funny to start, you know, breakfast was a big freaking salad and, you know, a right. little like chia drink of some sort that was like her version of a smoothie. And I think it's, it's, if you're not used to having salad for breakfast, it's a little bit different, but it was great. The, the food was wonderful and oh, really chia pudding too. Oh my God. Yeah, it was, uh, the food was amazing. And again, it's very sensible. It's really balanced. You know, they've done all the work on measuring macronutrients, micronutrients. You are definitely covered. And uh, I think it's it's a great, it's a great diet. So great. Uh, and I saw that uh, Linda asked, uh, do you know anything about UV therapy? Does it work with Lyme? I'm assuming you're talking about the insertion of a UV light via IV. Um, I, uh, we don't do it in our practice. I have had several patients that have done it. There are several doctors here in Southern California that offer it. I think the fundamental problem is that uh, I feel that way kind of about ozone therapy. If you're doing IV ozone, you know, the goal is to try and kill the bug. And in this case, you're only going to kill whatever happens to be circulating in and around that UV light. Uh, we've got bugs that hide in tissue. We've got bugs that hide, you know, in organ systems in which the UV light isn't going to touch at all. And for the cost out here, it's very expensive. I think for what people pay for it versus the return that they get on it is yeah. phenomenal. So it's not at the top of my list for therapies. Yeah, it's been my experience too. Works for some people, but most people just have that experience, you know? Uh, Krista would like uh, to talk about exercise. They've been told multiple things. I run about uh, 150 to 200 miles a month. Uh, yeah. Right on. A hiking, body weight, weights. I was told to, by what a doctor do, no running. One doctor I can run and a million pieces of advice in between. I understand many people can't exercise with disease, but if I feel good enough to run, can I? Absolutely. Who told you stop exercising? <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The only limitation with exercise is you and your body. So if you can't physically do it or you're wiped out for days afterwards, it's too much for you. But if you're physically capable to maintain that level of exercise, that's fantastic for your circulation, your immune system, your mental health. Go for it, girl. You know, the, the interesting thing, I mean, I agree with you, Darren. It's just like you got to do it and it, it's individual, right? Yeah. The other part is I'm looking at doing some work in our office with our patients and certainly anybody who's interested can reach out. Um, there's a lot of ways to make your um, exercise more effective and less the, you know, the problem, a lot of times if you have fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, things that where you have that sort of after exercise, you, you, you don't recover as well. It's like you go for a one mile walk and you can't stand up for a week. That's a different story. And, and, you know, if you're having a little bit of muscle breakdown, that's leading to a big, flare symptoms, there's some other things that you can do to help with your exercise. So um, I'm particularly interested in, I mean, one, I love it. Like when I had Lyme and Bart, uh, Babesiosis, I was just so happy. I could do kind of the stuff Krista's talking about and I didn't need to slow down. In fact, I felt like if I did slow down, I wasn't going to be able to get keep going. Whereas I know other people need to sit down or they're not going to be able to keep going. So there are individuals there, but you know, recently I've been, you know, toy playing around with, with some of our patients and some family members with blood flow restriction training because you can get a lot of high yield out of it. My question is, you know, in, in terms of like especially keeping muscle mass when you're less active and having it be, you know, you might have a 10 or 15 minute strenuous exercise, but it's really like you recover really quick because you're not damaging your muscles. You're more tricking your body into you know optimizing its hormone release and biochemistry and stuff but i don't know that in people who have lyme with sort of that fibromyalgia presentation that it's actually something that's going to be a good idea <laughs> so i i you know i have some folks who are interested in working on it with me so i'll keep everybody posted but certainly do exercise if you can even if that exercise is breathing you know i mean you got to just a little something yeah, Lisa made a comment about Joe Boroscano talking about not doing cardio. Um, I will respectfully disagree. 
I think again, you know, when you look at all the health benefits of cardiovascular exercise in terms of what it's doing for blood flow, and remember, part of like you know chronic Lyme anyway is that you get these immune complexes that form to basically deposit in your small capillary beds, obstructing blood flow. So it's like clogging up a pipe. So right. anything you can do to, to unclog that pipe is going you know, to bring more oxygen, more nutrients to the right tissue in the cells. So I, I have not seen practically for people that can maintain that that level of exercise that that has had any adverse effect on them. So I'm I'm do as much as you physically can. Right, and I think that well, and, and I think it's it's so important. Again, it's like I'm not a big fan in these blanket statements because if you can run, why run? Why I mean the one. Like you said, the most important thing to do is to keep your body moving, and and that's immune supportive, and it's also going to put you in the right mind state. But you know, I know Joe really well, and I love him, but I, I just I think he likes to to make those blanket statements, and I think we need to step back and just say, you know, what can you actually personally do? Um, and I tell people too sometimes people are so excited to be getting better, they overestimate it. So do 70% of what you think you can do. And then when you feel like you can do more, do 70% of that, you know, and until you're, you really know where your body's recovering. But I mean, if you can tell me you're running, you know, up to 200 miles a month and you're doing this and you're doing that, and you're doing calisthenics, body weight and all this, the, you, you're already listening to your body. And, and one of the things I find is that Lime, Lyme is good and bad. It's like, you know, it's like you become so aware, at least I did, about what your body feels like. And so if you're someone who has the ability to exercise, but you're reframing from exercise because you read something in somebody's outdated online treatment protocol, the problem is your body's telling you, I can do more. Your brain knows that, but then you're another part of your brain saying, well, I can't do that because so, so said so you're setting up this this sort of kind of war in your brain. And it's like your body wants to do more. Your mind wants to do more. You can do more. And it's so elevating to do that. So again, I mean, 70% of what you think you can do, um, but that's certainly not a prescription for no cardio. Yeah. And, you know, when I was in the, the beginning of Lyme, I couldn't get off the couch. I mean, the thought, and again, I was a, an athlete my entire life. And so it started with just literally sitting on the floor with stretching. That's all I could do. Then it migrated into, okay, let's walk around the house. Let's walk around the block. Then I was able, I mean, it took years to get to a point where I really felt like I started to get my stamina back. And then eventually I started studying martial arts and then eight years later I got a black belt. So, I mean, that was a 10 year. But I think, you know, Burroughs Scano's guideline too is also the assumption of people who do nothing. So yes, do you want to start going from nothing to running 200 miles a month? Absolutely no. not. You know that you got to start very slow and gradual. But for someone who's already been on a program of whatever it is, and if you're doing it and you tolerate it, again, this is just you got to be very individual and in what you can tolerate. But if you've never exercised or you haven't exercised in a long time, you're, you know your body's physically out of shape. You know you got to ease into it slowly. So you know do what you can, do what you can tolerate. And like Tom said, kind of move up progressively as you feel like you're doing okay with it. But you know you don't want to jump into some hardcore strenuous exercise when your body's not ready for it. That would be a disaster. Right. And don't the other thing is like going back to Terry Walls. I mean, if you want to know about exercise from somebody who was in a wheelchair to you know walking around town with us go read her stuff. I mean, and she works with a patient population. It's a little bit different than ours typically, but there is a lot of overlap. And she talks a lot about different ways to help your body exercise itself and different, you know, e-stims and all these other things you can use to help if you're one of those people who can't get off the couch at the moment or you're having a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, th there's a lot of really great things you can do with physical therapists, with, you know, things you can do at home. Yeah, Dr. Walls talks a lot about the e-stim. I actually bought an e-stim machine. Actually, I got it sitting right here. Oh, I can show you guys. So I got this on Amazon. It was like 60 bucks. I have no endorsement for this company. This is just what I bought. This is uh, our friend Amy Hopkins, who's a physical therapist in Austin, is the one who recommended this particular one. And uh, when you look at the device itself, it's really small. It's smaller than an iPhone. That's it. Nice. 
and it just has some electrodes, some pads you hook up. Uh, you would want a physical therapist to show you where to put the pads, how to set the settings. Uh, I did learn this when I was in medical school, but I haven't done it in 25 years, so I forgot everything. But uh, it is actually pretty easy to learn, and it can really help improve your mobility, help improve your strength. Uh, Dr. Wall's info, if you haven't read her book, it's called The Wall's Protocol. She also has a series of videos through her website. Uh, she does have one very specifically on exercise and e-stim uh, that you can, uh, I think it's, you can purchase it. So yeah, just uh, check out her, uh, her website. And I don't, yeah, and I haven't seen the video, but I know in her book, she talks about it, but um, I think the video would be sort of more updated and certainly follow her on Instagram and Facebook. I mean, she's always putting out information and and stuff like that, you know, and again, going back, cause there's a, there's a little bit of talk about like, um, you know, Joe's recommendation, you know, uh, I mean, man, it's, it's like, again, I think we, 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 I'm probably bringing up a horse that's already killed and we should just let it be, but you know, we should be getting like, in my opinion, Kristen, I don't even, I mean, I, I don't know anything about your medical care. So this isn't advice. It's just, I'm just talking off the top of my head is I get a stress test. If you have symptoms that make me suggest, think you need to get a stress test. Most people who are like, I run 200 miles a week and do calisthenics and I do um, a lot of hiking are not the first person I think of for a stress test. Now there are certainly indications where that might be the case, but you know, checking your heart, you know, health. I mean, there, there may be other things involved that I'm missing, but Again, I mean, talk to your doctor about these things, but the thing is, Joe is also giving guidelines for the sickest of the sick. And he also, you have to know where he comes from. He's one of the original people who was being persecuted for having a different opinion and advocating on the behalf of patients. So when he wrote these things back when he was in clinical practice, it was like, he, it was like, this is the only way you must do this because, you know, we didn't have all the knowledge we have today and we didn't have the openness to discuss it or talk about it. We didn't have Terry Walls online and Darren online and all this other stuff, you know? So we do have to take some of those recommendations with a grain of salt and then also understand how, how he treated because just because he was one of the few people who wrote Lyme guidelines, it didn't mean other people didn't have opinions. And so um, great resource, but use it like that as a resource. And just remember also, the history behind where the, what those guidelines came out of, right? And I mean, what he's done for everybody on right now and all patients with Lyme to be a trailblazer, you know, is exceptional. You know, you look at him and, Ray, and Charles Ray Jones and Richard Horowitz and Bernie Raxlin and B. Zantier and a few other, I mean, tons of other people that it's like they were, they made it possible for people like Darren and I to have this conversation openly with you. Right. And they I mean, they have a lot of skin in the game. And so they they needed to say things in a certain way, whereas now we can say, oh, there's some nuances and there's this and that. So it's kind of like we have a luxury here. So I don't want to, you know, disrespect, you know, Joe's previous statement. I certainly agree with all the things Darren and I have been saying about it. Um, and I felt that way when I first read it. And but at the same time, we have to know where they're coming from. And, and, and I think it's it's cool because now we can we're making progress because of his efforts and other people like his efforts. Yeah. So, well, I think, uh, that's all the questions we have. And, you know, as usual, you know, Tom and I could go on for hours and hours and hours and talk, but I know it's getting late out on the East coast. <laughs> yes. You're probably looking forward to saying goodnight to the family and heading off to bed. Cause I'm sure you're working tomorrow like the rest of us. Yeah, so. I should have brought my blue. I was thinking about bringing my blue blockers in today and I left <laughs> them in my bedroom, but I probably should have stuck them on a little while ago, but no, yeah. I hope you didn't disrupt your sleep too much. Nah, I'm pretty good with this. It's, I, I just appreciate everybody hanging out with us, you know, um, because it, it's such an important um, discussion to be able to have, you know, and, and Darren, I always thank you for just making it possible for us to have, you know, the East West coast sort of sounding board so that we can, it's nice to be able to have a conversation and, and, and be able to just talk the way you feel is true and share with everybody and answer their questions honestly and, and I think that, like, again, like, I, I like coming into the middle and saying this is the way, this is the middle ground here where a lot of people are going to be helped. So the, the pendulum swinging, in my opinion, hasn't worked politically. It hasn't worked 
you know, for a lot of things in society. And so for us to have these conversations is just like the highlight of, you know, for me. So thank you to everybody for letting us do this. And thanks for having me as part of the team here, Darren. Absolutely. Well, we're going to continue this. And then uh, Tom and I will actually be together in Boston at the end of October. So I'm sure we will put together a little something to broadcast live from iLads and give you guys sort of the latest uh, updates of what's going on in that world. Uh, And then hopefully we can maybe squeeze in another session. I know we're uh, trying to get uh, one of our friends, uh, Dr. Elisa Song. She's a a holistic pediatrician and we'd love to get her involved to start talking about Lyme and kids. Yeah. Uh, So the other thing, arrange that. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll knock that out. She's traveling right now. Otherwise we would have tried, we were going to try to have her be here tonight. Um, One of the other things that I wanted to, to just let people know is that um, I decided, you know, as you know, listening to us, I love, I, I think it's so important to focus on being grateful and our gratitude so that it just helps support our immune system and our heart and our overall health so that we can heal to our optimal potential. And so for, you know, and, and I talk about it a lot and I just said, you know what, I'm going to do a 30 day Instagram challenge for myself. You know, my family and I, we do our, our gratitude journals. I did a thing in our support group empowered by Lyme the other night, just kind of a, my rant on um, gratitude a little bit. I know Darren and Tyler were there. <laughs> it's like, he's at it again, but um, check out over uh, either on our Facebook page, Origins of Health, or over on my Instagram, uh, just Dr. Tom Moorcroft, um, and 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 join in, you know. And just I, I'm, you know, I'm I'm getting this sense that I'm gonna, you know, once a day, I'm just gonna be posting something I'm grateful for, whether it's completely blatantly obvious that I should be grateful for it, or if it's something completely different and something hidden. You know, like today, I I I, I realized as I was making a cup of coffee over the weekend, I had a little bit of sugar in it and I almost never put sugar in my coffee but it was a smidgen and my body doesn't even want a smidgen in my coffee anymore whereas years ago I used to drink coca-cola all the time and I talk about in my post today how I got off of that but if we can all share our gratitude together um, that'd be amazing so anybody wants to you know um, chime in on that that would make me feel really good and 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 sort of share the love so that we can help support other people better so thanks Great. Well, thank you for sharing, Tom. And if you guys aren't following Tom, please follow him on Instagram, follow him on his Facebook page as well. Again, we were providing different information at different times. So I think you guys are going to get the most bang for the buck by following both of us. And thank you guys all for joining us tonight. Have a great night, everybody.